Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode 100. Yes, you heard that right, and I can hardly believe it myself. The first episode of this podcast was published in August of 2017, and since that time, there have been nearly 20,000 downloads in more than 50 countries and places like the Ukraine, the United Kingdom, Italy, the Netherlands, Australia, Malaysia, Ecuador, Thailand, Japan, Morocco. And if you're listening, Morocco, you are my dream trip. So email me. I thought of a number of ways to celebrate the 100-episode mark, and after reading Elizabeth Campbell's book, The Desert Was Home, I was trying to figure out a way to share her book because it is so difficult to find and a bit cost-prohibitive for most of us. The last look I had at Amazon, there was one for $130. And what better way to celebrate than reading excerpts from a book written by a true, original lady of the desert? So the celebration will be over the course of two episodes, this one and next week, as I read selected excerpts. Before I get started, though, I want to thank you for your support in listening to this podcast, in following and interacting on social media, writing reviews, sharing it with your friends. I want to thank you for each time you met a woman you'd heard on the podcast and shared your excitement in meeting her or learning something new and inspiring about her. I want to thank each and every one of the women who have agreed to be interviewed and have shared not only their desert story, but so much about their lives and for all the good works they're doing in their individual spheres. And to you who have donated, whether once or monthly, to make this a truly community-supported effort. I'm beyond humbled and so grateful this effort has made it this far, and I couldn't have done any of it without you. So thank you. If you're unfamiliar with Elizabeth, or Betts as her husband called her, she was born in Beach Haven, New Jersey, so of course I feel an immediate kinship with her. She was born Elizabeth Warder Crozer, the youngest of four daughters, in 1893, and she died in 1971. She was raised in Upland, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, the daughter of a wealthy family, and her education through her postgraduate studies were in private schools. I'll tell you a little bit more about her next week. She met Bill, an orphan from Los Angeles, at a West Coast wedding where both of them were in the bridal party and they themselves married in 1920. Initially, they lived in Pasadena and Linda Vista, but Bill's health problems, stemming from his involvement in World War I, found them desperate to find a place where he could heal. That is where The Desert Was Home begins. This first excerpt is from the chapter called Exile. The 12 months prior to our desert move had almost slain me with the ever-present worry that I might lose my husband, despite all the doctors and I had tried to do for him. His inability to make a living because of ill health and the steadily mounting doctor's bills to be paid. On top of this, I had been weakened by the tragic loss of two prematurely born babies, and we had had to give up our home. When we started for the desert, disregarding the future or its consequences, our assets were our house furnishings stored with friends, an old second-hand Franklin car, and a small sum of money in cash. At the time, there were not many veterans' hospitals, and veterans' pensions were hard to obtain and slow in materializing. Bill and I had applied for one, but our chances of receiving it seemed rather nebulous. I thought about staying in town and working, but Bill needed me with him to care for him. We might have gone begging to relatives, but at that time I considered it out of the question. I was afraid that if Bill felt dependent on those who disapproved of him, it might crush him in his weakened state and seriously retard his recovery. We couldn't afford hotel accommodations, and we didn't want desert resorts. We had been through too much to be where it wasn't quiet and where things weren't elemental. Probably we drove out on the desert because we didn't know what else to do— and there was always the hope that Bill might improve if we found the right climatic conditions for him. With light camping equipment in the car, we had wandered from place to place, hoping to find some dry haven where Bill could breathe better. The search had not been easy, for we were looking for a climate not too cold in the winter, nor too hot in the summer, not too much dust-laden wind, no humidity, and not too high in altitude. The day before, we had driven in a howling, choking sandstorm that was bad for Bill's lungs— The clouds of dust were so thick that at times we had to get out and hunt for the pavement to be sure we were still on the road. Finally, on an old man's recommendation, we followed a dim wagon track, which, twisting through mountains and valleys, brought us to a line of springs in a desert valley, where we found shelter from the wind. 
Weary and discouraged after driving the almost abandoned road, we camped under the cottonwoods when it was too dark to see our surroundings clearly. We set up our tent and spent our first night at the place marked on old maps as 29 Palms. My heart sank like lead the next morning as I looked down from the tent at the distant view. So I shifted my gaze to the cottonwoods and saw a cement cattle trough from which flowed a tiny trickle of water supporting a thin line of green grass. There was a flash of color in the form of a costa's hummingbird taking a bath in the trickle that flowed from the trough. A hummingbird with a purple gorget was new to me, and my heart lightened a little. My husband awoke and raised himself on an elbow to look from the tent. Well, I said as cheerfully as I could, they have purple hummingbirds here anyway. The events of that day are still vivid in my memory, eating breakfast on an old army blanket before the fire, the smell of bacon, coffee, and campfire smoke on the air, exploring the line of springs and resting under the cottonwoods. In a slight depression between two mesquites, we set up our one-pole tent in which we stacked our possessions and beside which we parked our comfortably ancient touring car. Under the cottonwood, we built a little fireplace of stone and scrap metal, and here we cooked our meals. A former camper had cleaned the thorns from the lower limbs of the mesquite, and on these we hung our pots and kettles, while a line strung from the mesquite to cottonwood served for drying our clothes and damp towels. Two folding chairs and a card table completed our equipment, and we slept either in the tent or car, letting down the back of the front seats, which had been hinged. It is astonishing how cold it can be on the desert in winter. We first camped in December, and for ten weeks there were cold nights and some cold days, while ice frequently formed about the edges of the waterholes. This meant that we had to gather a great deal of firewood in order to keep warm evenings. As none remained at the oasis, we hauled wood from a distance once a week. Taking everything removable from the car, we drove to the Mesquite Crown Dunes eight miles north of our camp and piled the car high with chunks of mesquite chopped with the axe from the dead thickets. Once loaded, we strolled about looking for arrow points, for Indians had camped in the dunes. How I loved those dunes! There were miles of them, topped with mesquite sheltering little warm hollows lying between. Nearly all were ripple-marked from the wind, and as the sand was mostly well-packed, walking was a pleasure. Sometimes we took our lunch and stayed till the sun went down, and while Bill rested, I walked for miles until I knew almost every hummock and hollow. Usually there was a light breeze blowing, and something about its fresh softness always made me think of the seashore. When the sun stopped, the distant mountains turned a purple rose, a frequent desert phenomenon of early winter and spring, and then the yellow dunes took on a golden hue that was almost unbelievably intense. Returning before dark, we unloaded our wood and stacked it near the camp fireplace, enough to last for another week. Some of the oasis springs were open and slimy, but one had been dug out and lined with rocks like a little well and was covered with a wooden lid. Here we dipped water with a two-pound coffee can and filled our canteens and water bags. We had brought a small metal wash tub, and we took baths in this and used it for washing clothes. Some days it seemed to me that I no sooner finished cooking one meal over a campfire than it was time to build a fire for the next effort. One of our standbys was stew, placed in a Dutch oven and buried in a depression lined with hot ashes. Covering the lid with hot ashes and dirt, we could leave it all day, only a tiny jet of steam issuing from the clay to mark its presence. On stew days, we could take our lunch and be gone for hours, knowing that when we returned, there would be a good hot supper ready and waiting for us. Our nearest town was 61 miles away, and 45 of that wasn't road at all, just ancient wagon track winding in and out among the bushes, two ruts with an appallingly high hump in between. We did not usually go for provisions oftener than every three or four weeks, and I learned to keep vegetables fresh, buried in a paper-lined box in the shade. Every four or five days, I took them out and crisped them in fresh water, aired them, and put them back again. Our worst problem by far was too many inquisitive people straying into camp. Just when we needed solitude and quiet, we had callers who lingered or asked themselves to meals, a drain on our slender resources. Most of the element was rough in the extreme, often dirty and frequently drunk. However, not all the people we met were rough. At the spring one day, we talked to Dave and Anna Post on their way to a mine. At first sight, we liked and respected them, and through the years, they have been our good friends. Then there was Bill McCaney, as well as a few others. 
That was a windy spring back in 1925, and I remember times when the silt and dust almost choked us. It was hard to be agreeable when sand was in everything from my frying pan to my toothbrush and when the preparation of food was a veritable nightmare. As February approached, the willows at the springs turned green and the cottonwoods tasseled in little red streamers. More and more birds returned and our few winter rains brought up millions of tiny plants. For nearly three months, we had camped at a public water hole to see what dry air would do for Bill, who was noticeably better and had gained in weight. Life was hard and the struggle to live wearied us, while the lack of privacy interrupted all our days. We found ourselves growing morose, inclined to self-pity and irritable. Now it is one thing to go to the desert for a vacation because you want to, but that is a far cry from being told you have to stay there and knowing that you're exiled. I was suffering mental anguish over our losses and was desperately worried over Bill's health. I was completely shut off from the kind of companionship that I craved, and always the spook of our dwindling dollars haunted me. I tried to step out on high faith in a happy future, but deep down inside me, I couldn't get away from our grief and hard luck. I used to look at Bill and wonder what was going on in his mind, but it is always hard to guess a reserved Scotchman's thoughts. I knew that his breakdown in health was a severe blow to him, but it was his nature to be lighthearted and not take life too seriously. He drew a certain pleasure from camping by a desert waterhole that I could not force myself to feel, though I tried hard enough. He had always wanted to get out in the open and was not too sad about experiencing it, but for me, our dusty waterhole was no camping paradise, and I found it a poor substitute for a home. On a quiet afternoon when the cattle were absent and no visitors were about, I sat in my camp chair and gazed off across the desert, wondering what I had ever done to deserve being set down here among range cows and rough people, far from friends and books. While the physical things were hard, by far the worst thing was the lack of social and intellectual contacts, a kind of loneliness that staggered me. Situated as we were, it was impossible to pack books around us. If I could have had books, I might have been all right. As the stillness grew too oppressive and I reached the stage of wanting to bang my head against the cottonwood bowl, I got up and tramped across the desert, taking the dog with me. I didn't return until weariness overcame me. One night, when feeling particularly depressed, I walked away in the moonlight and stood looking up at the lovely old palm trees sharply etched against the sky. I tried to think clearly. Obviously, we had camped long enough at the spring. What could we do? I had known for a long time that Bill had had the homesteading bee in his bonnet, and I had discouraged him. I didn't want to own land here for fear the desert would forge chains about us that we would not be able to break. Yet, because it was agreeing with Bill, we had to stay for a while anyway. Well, we couldn't sit under the palms with cattle and burrows all our life. At least a homestead would bring us privacy— A one-room cabin would mean protection from the wind and dust, and I could have a wood stove to simplify cooking. I visualized a little room with a fireplace and on the wall a shelf of books. It would be a great adventure, something to drive away our blues, and any action was better than sitting under a palm tree and getting sore at the world. All this passed through my thoughts, but it was the fireplace and shelf of books that brought about my surrender. I turned on my heel with a catch in my breath, for something had snapped in my makeup. I hurried back to my husband. When I walked into camp, a strange man had handed Bill our mail that he had kindly brought all the way from town. Bill gave me mine, a great stack of letters, and kept his own. I watched him opening a long envelope, and not even his scotch reserve could hide the pleasure in his expression as he handed me the letter. It was a notice that his pension had been granted, and enclosed a check for our first month's allotment. I shed tears of joy. What do you say we get a piece of land and homestead? I flung at him when I could catch my breath. I could see his eyes brighten, but he exercised restraint. I've thought of that, he said slowly, but I was afraid it would be too hard on you. It wouldn't be as hard as sitting here in the dirt with cows and burrows and no roof over my head, I replied. All right, Bill answered, new cheer in his voice. We'll build a little cabin or garage and live in it. We won't stay here long, he assured me. Maybe six months or a year, but we'll always have it for a retreat or vacations. And so began our real living on the desert, the year to be spent on a homestead. Spring on the desert again, and the cottonwoods are in tassel. Three hummingbirds have nests on low limbs in our big yard trees. Seeds are sprouting in fine green lines in our vegetable garden, and our almond trees are lovely in their spring bloom. 
We eat breakfast under the honeysuckle vine on our pergola and the sunshine streams down on us. We are able to do any amount of hard work. We have been here 20 years. This next section is from the chapter titled Homesteading. Desert baths dance in my memory in many ways. Perhaps I stood on a bath mat and washed in hot water in a basin. Sometimes it was in a metal tub in the cabin or under the stars by an open campfire at night. There was the cat's claw bush and the muslin lean-to and hose. Many times it has been beside a water hole where I poured water over myself with a tin dipper, and I've plunged in water holes and dabbled in desert springs. All of us looked forward to having a regular bathroom, which, sooner or later, we did manage to install. But I think the invigoration and fun in bathing vanished when our conventional bathrooms appeared. Outhouses have been described till the subject waxes threadbare. Still, no homesteader can look back without remembering many things about them. Some defied description, while others were up-to-date, as ours was, with good roof, white paint, screened vents, lime and ash bins, modern seat and lid— when our first bathroom was installed in the former tool house, we had no less than nine bids for the outhouse. Neighbors drove up to pass the time of day, and after a few irrelevant remarks came to the point. That outhouse now, they said, looking longingly toward it, it's a good one, and I'd like to buy it, if you haven't promised it to anyone else. I won't sell it to anybody, Bill replied, and I won't haul it anywhere. He knew he'd never hear the last of it if he took it for a ride. I want it out of here in a hurry, and someone with a truck will have to take it away. If they don't, I'll destroy it. In two hours, it was gone, bumping over the desert on an old truck. The woman who received it thought she had the best outhouse in the valley, but her pride changed to annoyance when passersby made use of it. A large sign on the door said, Closed for the season. Haircuts were a real problem, for the nearest barber was over the mountains and in the blue distance. Some wives cut their husband's hair and didn't seem to make too bad a job of it. Do you think you could trim my hair? Bill asked me one day, just enough to tide me over until I get to a barber. I said I would try, so I trimmed one side, and then in trying to get the other side like it, made it shorter, and returned in desperation to the first side. Finally, I finished with a flourish of the clippers across the back of his neck. Bill took one look in the mirror and turned accusing eyes upon me. Woman, he said reproachfully, you've absolutely ruined me. Two weeks later, he managed to make the trip into town to his favorite barber, who looked at him in horror. My heavens, he exploded. Whoever cut your hair last time? I never was asked again to serve as tonsorial artist. The bareness of our surroundings depressed me so, as summer days neared, I decided to have some grass and flowers, though everyone discouraged me. I went up to the oasis and cut a truckload of arrowweed stalks, which I stuck in the ground in a sort of basket weave fence. It looked only so-so, but served to keep out jackrabbits, and inside the enclosure I started a garden. I planned a small grass plot for the center, edged with rocks and bordered with flowers and cottonwood trees. I bought nothing, friends sending me clippings and seeds from their gardens in town. I planted only cottonwoods, willows, and athels as slips, for these were at hand. There was an old fig tree at the oasis, and I started several cuttings from that, which grew and yielded delicious white figs. In spite of the dry air and other difficulties, my garden flourished, and by the end of the year I had a gay little plot that was balm to my soul. It helped me to take root in the desert soil. I put out a pan of water for the wild birds, and I could look away from the desert view that at times overpowered me, rest my eyes on my spot of greenery, and perhaps see an orange oriole or a vermilion flycatcher in my little cottonwood trees. Washing was a job I had done for months, kneeling on sand while I scrubbed away in two tin wash tubs. I had no wringer, and I even had to wring sheets by hand, spreading them on the bushes to dry. My little pumper served for washing machine, but I was the motive power behind it, and after heating water on the cook stove and washing in the tin tubs, I was always worn out. About this time, I made the acquaintance of mail-order catalogs, which have loomed large in my desert life. I longed for a model of washing machine run by an air-cooled gasoline engine, for electricity was miles over the horizon. After scheming and budgeting, we decided we could send for the washer. My disappointment was intense when a letter returned saying that the last one had been sold. But rather than leave a homesteader's wife in the lurch, they were sending an electric model with pulley attached and a gasoline engine to drive it. They hoped it would serve my purpose. We could use the engine for other projects, and, bless their heart, I could have all this for the price of the original washer. 
The machine was shipped by freight, brought 61 miles over the desert track in a neighbor's truck, and we set it up on the front porch, bolting both the engine and washer down to two-by-fours. I soon learned to start the engine myself, heaving against the wheels and spinning them over. The days I washed, there was a continuous row. Chuff, poom, chuff, poom, 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 chuff, poom, chuff, poom, 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 chuff, poom, chuff, poom. The noise broadcasting for miles that I was doing the washing. But wash day lost its terrors with machine and ringer doing most of the work for me. Caring for food took time, but after the windmill was pumping, Bill built me a desert cooler in lieu of an icebox. This was a series of shelves supported on the corners by two-by-fours, had a hinged door in front, and the hole covered with burlap. Water dripping from a pipe on the pointed roof above moistened all the burlap, and the rapid evaporation in the dry air reduced the interior to almost icebox coolness. During the hot months, we put our bed on the west side of the cabin, where the prevailing breeze fanned us, and where, on awakening, we watched the birds hopping about the garden patch. There, after hectic or lonely days, we found rest, all our troubles fading away from the magic of a desert night. When fall came, nights were frosty, and our little sheet metal heating stove always made the cabin too hot or too cool. I begged for a fireplace. To find or pay a stonemason was out of the question. Like everything else on the homestead, we would have to build it ourselves. We started gathering rocks and found that being rock conscious was lots of fun. Wait, I would cry as we drove over the desert. Stop, stop, there's a rock. Out we climbed, turned over the rock, discussed its angles and cracks, reared it on end, decided whether it was suitable for chimney corner or hearth, and lugging it over to the car, finally heaved it onto the floorboards. By bringing home just a few rocks at a time, we finally had enough for a chimney. Bill did things well and seldom started anything until he knew what he was about. On trips to the coast, he studied friends' fireplaces and kept notes on the measurements of openings, throats, and chimney flues. Still, he was doubtful of his ability to build a fireplace that would not smoke. Even those built by experienced masons sometimes smoked, he told me. Well, ours could do no worse, I replied. From the mail-order house, we bought a small cement mixer that could be turned by hand or rigged up to the washing machine engine, and then we began. We're proud of that little fireplace, for it does not smoke and still warms our dining room. We found one lovely rock to go across the opening in place of an angle iron, and another a perfect size for a mantel shelf. When the cement was dry and we were ready for a fire, Bill asked if I would like to invite some friends to celebrate lighting it. But I wanted to be alone. This was the first home we had ever owned. This hearth wasn't rented. It was ours. Bill knelt and struck a match. It caught and sputtered. And while we held our breath, the smoke curled gracefully up the chimney, not a puff drifting into the room. He reached over and took my hand, and we waited in silence. I couldn't think of anything to say that was adequate, but finally I found words. I think you're wonderful, I said softly. That fireplace was worth all the hunting of rocks, the heaving them into place, and the heavy work we put into it. You certainly enjoy things more when you sweat and toil to get them. When we made final entry and proved up on our land, our papers came through with the name of the President of the United States on them. Now our homestead was really ours, and we felt proud of it. We had been on our acreage for more than two years now, and we were reaping the reward of hard work in the improved appearance of things. The side porches were cemented, and our trees were shooting up higher than the roof. A tool shed stood to the north, and the windmill and tank were near it. Twenty acres were enclosed with willow posts and barbed wire, and two acres fenced with woven wire. A sort of barn garage was going up to the east, a kitchenette and bedroom had been added to the cabin, and we were planning to convert the tool shed into a bathroom with running water. We loved our little home and enjoyed it. Unless you have lived through cold and merciless heat with nothing between you and the outdoors but the canvas walls of a tent— you cannot imagine the sense of shelter and security you feel when you walk in the door of a house. I sometimes wonder if a home could have meant more to anyone than our cabin did to us after we roughed it for so long. It wasn't easy working on the big house, but we kept right at it. Our old truck brought many loads of stone down from the mountains for the walls, sand and gravel from the surrounding desert and reinforcing steel from miles away. My husband's rock work was beautiful, and all day he laid up stone, while every evening after supper we went up on the scaffold and pointed up to the day's work. It took us nearly three years to complete it. 
When we felt flush, we hired men and went to work, and when funds were low, we worked with our own hands. Sometimes I felt that as long as I lived, I would never know peace and quiet, that my whole life would be accompanied by the everlasting wang of a cement mixer punctuated by the sound of a hammer on stone and the poom poom of the gasoline engine. It was a beautiful house, for we had been wise enough to have one of our architect friends plan it for us, and the colors of the desert stone blended into the landscape with its browns, grays, and burnt reds. In our fence two acres, we planted trees— pomegranates, almonds, early apples, winter pears, figs, and musket grapes we put in for our larder, Arizona cypress, hardy pines, Lombardi poplars, Siberian elms, eucalyptus, and oleanders for beauty and shade. We found a few drought-resistant vines for the pergola that had replaced the shed roof on the cabin and shrubs that would stand the summer heat. Perhaps the best lesson we learned was that if you wanted something and went right after it, the chances were you'd get it, whether you had means and opportunity in your favor or not. Later, when we dug our deep well and secured our big pump, our need for a reservoir was great. The knowledge that we could use it for a swimming pool in hot weather didn't make us want it any less, but the estimates were prohibitive. So we ended by getting the shovels and the little tractor we had bought and digging the excavation ourselves. We always tried to tell people that things could be done on the desert. Of course, you had to work hard and care for things, but if you did, you could have much beauty. We had created something. Now we had a house, plumbing, barn, pool, and shade. When we topped the rise on approaching home, we could see our windmill, buildings, and green trees nesting against our golden hill that rose behind them. Neither Bill or I were talking about moving into town. This section of the book is from the chapter called Thorns. Bill was never aggressive, but he had the courage of his convictions and was absolutely fearless. Though he knew for a while that he was the only man in our district standing openly for the right, he took comfort from his philosophy of life, which was simply that one right-thinking man should be able to accomplish more good than a dozen wrongdoers. Two factions gradually came into being, one law-abiding that stood with Bill, the other which found it convenient to keep the country unsettled and discourage law and order. And the unlawful element was in the majority. Anyone who showed a spark of integrity or was a friend of ours was our satellite and was the recipient of jeers or affronts. Our sheriff had been in power for more than 20 years, and that is too long for some sheriffs. Besides that, he was related to the cattlemen who had grazing privileges in our district. That was the root of the whole trouble. As I ride around the desert today, I think there is much to be said for the cattlemen, however. Cowboys didn't exterminate mountain sheep or destroy the desert growth. They didn't carry away desert holly or cactus to die in somebody's garden. They never set fire to old, fine Joshua trees, hundreds of years old, just to see how good a torch they would make. I go to the beautiful palm groves around the water holes and see the bulls of the stately old palms mutilated with initials and names for all to read the names of homesteaders, not cattlemen or cowboys. There are, of course, some homesteaders who cherish the desert and try to conserve its growth and wildlife, but the many who do not have left their ravages like locusts. When we were open range, the desert was wild, beautiful, and clean. No ancient trailers or cheap buildings peppered the landscape. No ugly poles stood out to mar a treeless land. The old desert wasn't littered with bottles and tin cans, and papers weren't blowing in every direction. Do I sound like a matriarch mourning for the good old days? Well, maybe I am a trifle. Small desert towns can be attractive, but most of them are not. I appreciate the fact that I now live in a judicial township and that the days of universal gun-toting are past. I, too, have electricity and telephone service brought to me by ugly poles, but I know the desert was lovelier without those things. The cattlemen were always decent to us. We were never forbidden to picnic beside their windmills or waterholes, Perhaps their worst fault was the subtle shielding of any element that might have kept the county wild, but it is hard to tell how much they did of that. They suffered, too, at the hands of homesteaders. Their calves were rustled, their cattle frightened away from water holes, and their valuable bulls shot with no more excuse than someone claiming to be afraid of them. The coming of homesteaders and barbed wire fences means the outsting of cattle, and I know how the cattlemen felt. When I looked at the dunes from afar— the dunes I will always love and know I can no longer roam over because they are homestead land, private property in short. I think the same sadness of spirit, the same senseless rage possesses me that must have made the cattlemen boil when we early settlers were determined to homestead. 
This excerpt is from the chapter titled Paradise. I stood beside my husband on top of a desert mountain pass gazing spellbound at the vast panorama spread before us, tremendous alluvial slopes, dry lake beds in the distance, mountains jutting up here and there finally to merge into a great range on the horizon, and above all, the sky. White billowy clouds raced across the heavens against their blue background with every one casting a shadow, a patch of purple on the gold of the desert floor. Purple and gold, the desert colors. Golden sands, yellow granites, cream-colored dry lakes, golden sunlight bathing everything and purple shadows, canyons deep in lavender light, mountain ranges, misty lavender in the distance, purple cloud marks trailing the desert floor, old bottles left on the desert sand turn purple from the sun's actinic rays, even the wildflowers are more often lavender or yellow than any other colors. The gold of mines for material riches, the purple for spiritual vestments. When I think of the desert, I think of those two colors, and with them always great light, throbbing, pulsating light. Some things seem to me the very essence of the desert, though I cannot tell why one thing should seem so more than the other. Golden light, the tender spring green of cottonwoods, a vermilion flycatcher's breast flashing in the sun, mountain ranges gold or rose in the sunset light, and above all the smell of wet creosote bush heralding the coming of rain, a fragrance like incense permeating the whole desert with freshness. But perhaps the keynote is the stillness a quiet so great that you can almost hear it. That is the most restful and soothing thing of all. Don't the stillness and the continuous sunshine get on your nerves, friends ask us? No, good things never get on our nerves. We never tire of love or good health or fine weather. We never long for hate or illness or dull days. When we are away from home and awaken to dark mornings, we find it hard to start the day feeling as brisk and cheerful as we should. When we sleep under the stars at night, we never wish they were obscured, and when we eat breakfast under the pergola bathed in sunshine, we don't sigh for miserable weather. Thunderstorms come in summer, some winter, and spring rains fall, and few days of the year are cloudy or windy, but almost all of the year is clear, fine, and golden, and that is paradise enough for desert dwellers. This section is from a chapter in the book called Pioneer Spirit. I can't remember any panic over the fact that we had no doctor, drugstore, or telephones, for we just took care of ourselves, nearly everyone taking his turn nursing the sick. One morning, at 2.30, a voice woke us outside our cabin window. I wonder, it said apologetically, if you could do something for me. Someone dropped a cigarette in a basin of gasoline and kicked the basin in fright, throwing flaming gas all over me. I'm terribly burned. Could we do something? We certainly could, and with what first aid was at hand soon had the sufferer quieted, bandaged, and tucked in bed, where he slept for more than twelve hours from the sheer relief from pain. For a while I was the only woman available, and everyone hurt or ill was brought to me. Often I was all but staggered, sometimes not having the faintest idea what was the matter with people, but there you were, a hundred miles from nowhere, and it was up to you to do the best you could, right or wrong. When a nurse came to live in our valley, I was severely criticized for rushing in where a trained nurse feared to tread. I didn't like the responsibility and went to the nearest doctor to ask for advice. Do just what you are doing, he said. The chances are that 99 times out of 100 you'll do the right thing. You can't stand and let people suffer or die because you're afraid to make an effort. Drugs we didn't use, but we did keep simple remedies at hand, and often all people needed was love and friendship. A helping hand went down, the right food, and plenty of care and laughter, and no one ever thought of charging a patient anything. Our food was plain in the extreme, but anyone was welcome to share it. Said an Eastern relative to me in horror, You don't mean to say you take those people into your house and nurse them? Certainly we did, and never made any bones about it just gave them our bed and moved on to army cots ourselves, our household flowing peacefully on with one more person added. I don't think it irked us much. We just took it in stride. We took in tubercular patients, too, and I think their recovery was largely due to the fact that we didn't treat them like lepers. We nursed many people, and we were just glad to do it. When a baby came and the mother was not doing well, the neighbors took shifts around the clock, so someone was always in attendance. Most everyone recovered, and I think that many were saved just by love and strength of mind pulling for them. 
We weren't working for pay, and they were our friends. We simply had to save them and made them feel it. Many veterans who came to the desert for their health were frail, discouraged with living, separated from home and all they held most dear. We, too, had been exiled. We knew all the struggle and loneliness. Taking them in did something for them and for us, too, and there was no obligation. They happened to need us, and it was understood that one day we might need them. One criticism frequently heard of Western men is that they work their women to death. It is not altogether unjustified, for women on the frontier certainly do work very hard. I think, though, in justice to our men, that it should be stressed that we often did things that were not required of us. I liked being beside Bill when he was putting up fences or laying up rock. I was pleased when he sought my opinion as to how cement work looked or where a well should be dug. Perhaps our men did expect a good deal of us in a muscular way, but there were compensations— We swelled with pride when someone from town said our men were lucky to have such women for wives, and our hearts sang when our husbands said we were good sports. We weren't pampered or coddled, it is true, but if we were sick or hurt, our men did everything for us, and there are few Western men who aren't ready to fight at the drop of a hat if their wives are criticized. They stood between us and the world, and we knew it and appreciated it. Sometimes we had short spells of being sorry for ourselves, but a need would arise and we'd snap out of it. Our men couldn't homestead without us, and we took pride in putting our shoulders to the wheel and helping push. I see Bob's wife now, bumping over the desert in his old truck that only she seemed to be able to start. I remember John's wife in overalls, hands greasy in the midst of taking down their car to get at a bad bearing. I see Mary Gray hauling a drag behind her car to make her road passable. I see Nell turning a heavy cement mixer while her husband was building their chimney. And I see myself working on wells and setting rocks and chimneys on the ridge pole. I can only say for our men that what they let us do didn't seem to hurt us. We all were healthy. There was so little time to be sick. And I think that most of us loved the life much as our men did. It is all part of the pioneer spirit, that willingness to help, whether it's on the end of a Stilson wrench by your husband's side or working on a public road, and is one of the greatest blessings that ever comes to a homesteader's wife. When we had been on the desert for 12 years, changes came so fast we could scarcely adjust to them. Most of the people who had filed on land had sold to others when their titles were clear. Some homesteads were cut up into lots, with people more or less looking into one another's windows. We had acquired things that brought us comfort, and now we had nice homes, electricity, and telephones. Station wagons had replaced our old cars, and we had ice and electric devices. Our school was greatly enlarged, and a high school had been built. There were doctors, a small hospital, drug stores, and other shops in our midst, and hotels and motels sprang up like mushrooms almost overnight. You can't seem to gain anything without losing something, and our lovely pioneer spirit of self-reliance and helpfulness was gone. No longer did one feel free to ask others to help raise his house, and the days were over when we worked to build needed roads with a good hot dinner served from the tailboard of a truck. Every homesteader was as good as the next in the early days, and now there were cliques and groups who did not intermingle. It was inevitable that people would make friends only with those of like interests and education, and that as scattered homesteads changed to a crowded town, they would no longer find time to work on their neighbors' homes and wells. If you are sick, now there are doctors and hospitals, scientific care, but you won't get love with it, though I am the last to criticize the good work of hospitals. I think, however, that no one would deny that in the early days we had something to give each other, bestowed without price, that professional service doesn't offer. The old desert bonds were gone, with the white-faced cattle, burrows, and unmarred desert beauty, and there just wasn't a thing we could do about it. I wonder if while you were listening, there may have been a few things that really stood out to you about what Elizabeth said about the desert. And if there was, I hope you'll share it either on the Facebook page, Desert Lady Diaries, or send me an email at desertladydiaries at gmail.com and let me know what it was and how it made you feel. Thanks so much for listening today, and I'll be back next week with the rest of the selections from The Desert Was Home.